You don't fall in love, nor do you fall out of love. Love is something you deliberately decide to do and to give. Let's pray together. Father God, please teach us to love one another so the way we live points others to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please do take a seat. We return tonight to our series in the book of 1 Peter. You'll find that on page 1015. And it'd be a great help if you could have that open in front of you. Our focus this evening is chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And I've got four points to guide us through that. You can see those in the back of your service sheet. And you'll see that our first point is this, living as strangers. This letter was written to Christians surrounded by trial and hostility. Peter, who wrote the letter, wants those who belong to Jesus to live differently to those around them, to live differently in every situation they'll find themselves in. He wants them to live as God's chosen, holy people. He wants them to live as strangers in the world. He's already told us why in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, that is among the non-Christians, honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we're to live in a way that commends God to the world around us. We're to live differently as strangers so that people see something of Jesus in the way we act. In chapter two, Peter covered what it looks like to be a Christian in society, in our relationship with the government. And he's also covered what it's like to be a Christian in the workplace. And our focus tonight in verses 1 to 7 of chapter 3 are where he explores what it looks like to be a Christian in family life, in marriage. I know not all of us here are married, but the lessons here are for all of us. Perhaps marriage is a present reality. Perhaps it will be a future reality. We can all support the marriage of others. But there are general lessons too about what matters most and about how to relate to one another. Before we get to that, though, we need to see that in each of those different situations that Peter has guided us through, he teaches us that the way to live is by following the example of what Jesus did on the cross. Look at chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you may follow in his steps. Jesus came to show us what God was like, and he can do that because he was God. But he didn't just come to show us what God was like, he came to bring us to God. And the way he did that was by being executed on the cross, despite the fact that, as Peter points out, he had committed no sin. Verses 22 and 23 say this, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled... He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So if Jesus was so perfect, why was he crucified? The answer is that he wasn't crucified for the bad that was in him. He was crucified for the bad in us. Verses 24 and 25 of chapter 2. He, Jesus, bore on our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Do you see that? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds you have been healed. We're made well. We're made the people we were meant to be. What was wrong with us? We'd rejected our maker. We'd lived as if he didn't exist, putting ourselves first, regardless of the cost. In rejecting God, we deserved to be punished and were separated from our creator God. 
but Jesus carried our sin so that we could return to the shepherd of our souls. He died to pay for our sins, and he died to bring us to God. So have you allowed Jesus to pay for your sin and bring you to God? If not, then why not? Perhaps you need more time and, uh, and space to think it through. Well, two things to do. Take this leaflet, uh, Why Jesus? It's free. And secondly, consider joining one of our courses called Christianity Explored or Life Explored, which is similar, and there are details at the back. Jesus died for your sins. He died to bring you to God. That's the first thing you need to respond to. But once you've done that, there is more. Jesus also died to show us how to live. And that leads us to our next point. We are to be loving as Christ did. Loving as Christ did. Becoming a Christian leads you into a new way of living, much better than you've ever had before. A new, better way of life that follows the pattern of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean no suffering, but it is a better life. So what does that look like for those who are married? Well, look at chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. And chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. What does he mean by likewise? He's already made the point that citizens under a government and those employed by a master should follow Christ's example. And now he says, those of you who are married, the same is true of you. You are to love one another in the same way that Jesus loved you. What does that look like? It means costly sacrifice. It means making your goal doing what is best for the other person and not just demanding your rights. That's what a Christ-like marriage looks like. Love is not something that just happens. It requires work, hard work. It requires deliberate decisions and actions. It requires commitment. You don't fall in love, nor do you fall out of love. Love is something you deliberately decide to do and to give. It's okay to feel in love. God made us with emotions, and that includes that emotional rush of meeting and getting to know and relating to that someone special in your life. However, Loving as Christ loved is primarily about commitment. For so many people, love means I love what you can do for me. So when the relationship stops meeting their needs, they want to get out. But the lesson here is that love means saying, I want you and what's best for you. Love is always about giving, not receiving, which is why it's so costly. We're to love one another as Christ loved us. Now, to drive this point home, Peter considers a particularly challenging situation. Look again at verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So here's the situation. A woman is married to someone who's not a believer. That's not something that you should get into deliberately. In places like 1 Corinthians 7, the Bible is clear that we shouldn't choose to marry an unbeliever. But it looks like what's happened here is that the couple who are married have both heard the word. The wife believed that word. The husband hasn't yet believed. And even in this tough situation, Peter says the wife should love him as Christ loved her. These verses are not saying that actions are more important than words. Evangelism, sharing the good news, is always about proclaiming the good news. Loving actions never replaces that. But loving actions do reinforce the word. And what he's saying here is that husbands may be won over to the word that they've already heard by the godly behavior of their wives. It means a Christian wife commits to the marriage and to the sacrifices involved to make it work, even if her husband is not a Christian. 
It's worth saying at this point that believers who are married to spouses who are not believers face many challenges. And as a Christian family, we need to walk with them and love them and pray with them and work hard to encourage them in their marriage. Their calling is the same as the calling for all those who are married. To love as Christ has loved us. So thirdly, loving as equals. There's a really wonderful phrase in verse 7 that's really, really important. Have a look at that. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Don't be put off by that phrase. We'll come back to it. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. By which I take he means the couple's prayer time together. So what Peter has in mind here is the pattern of a Christian husband married to a Christian wife. And he reminds them, and us, that they are both equally recipients from God of the grace and the gift of life. In other words, they're both on their way to heaven. And in God's sight, they don't just belong together, they belong to Jesus. At the time, this would have been countercultural. But it is a powerful and wonderful picture of a man and woman as partners who worship God together, who serve God together, who study his word together, who encourage one another to live as strangers in the world together. And perhaps most powerfully of all, to pray together. It's a reminder that Christian marriage is a genuine partnership under God. Here's how a Christian from a previous generation expressed what's involved in this spiritual partnership of marriage. This is by uh, a pastor called Richard Baxter. He says this to Christian couples. You are especially to be helpers of each other's salvation to stir one another up in faith, in love, in obedience, in good works, to warn and help each other against sin and all temptations, to join in God's worship in the family and in private, to prepare each other for the approach of death and to comfort each other in the hopes of eternal life. We are to love as equals, But then fourthly, we are to love as men and women. I'm sure you've noticed that he doesn't just talk here to married people. He talks to wives and then he talks to husbands. Both are equal. Both are called to love as Christ did. But he addresses them differently. It looks differently to work those things out because men and women are called to play different roles in the marriage. That's what we recognize when we make our wedding vows. The groom says, I take you to be my wife, to love, cherish, and worship. While the bride responds, I take you to be my husband, to love, to cherish, and to obey. Men and women play different roles in the marriage. For the wife, that means being subject or submissive to her husband, Not to men in general, not every husband. It's talking here of her husband. You see that in verse 1. For the husband, that means being understanding and honoring his wife. You see that in verse 7. This isn't just something from the time this letter was written. It's part of how God created us. And he created us like this because this is how teams work. Different roles working as one. And the concept and the language used may evoke a strong negative reaction in us, but we do need to make sure we understand what is being said correctly. It doesn't mean that the husband is the superior sex and should get away, get his way all the time, while his wife's role is to do everything he tells her to do. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean a husband can be abusive It doesn't mean she is the property of her husband. Such attitudes and behavior are to be rejected and repented of. 
The phrase in verse 7 about showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel simply recognizes that women are often more vulnerable. That's not a negative thing. After all, God loves and uses us in our weakness. You just need to look at the cross to see that. And that may offend you, but don't we instinctively know that this is true? Isn't that why you don't let your friend walk home on her own in the dark? That vulnerability is a good thing. But because of sin, it can expose women to awful behavior. Isn't that at least part of the cry of the Me Too movement? And here, instead, we read in verse 7, husbands are to show honor to the woman. Her her husband is to love her sacrificially as Christ has loved us, to respect her, to protect her, to work towards making the marriage a genuine partnership under God. This verse never justifies any abuse within a marriage. In these verses, the wife is encouraged to set aside outward and short-term external beauty and instead nurture inner beauty. It doesn't mean wearing old and ugly clothes. It just means the focus should be on what is inside us. So guys, what are you looking for in a wife? Is it mainly about looks and the kind of beauty that will not last? Or is it, as it should be, on godliness and Christ-likeness? For all of us, this is countercultural. In a world of Instagram, our focus is so often on image. But look at verse 4. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit. A gentle and quiet spirit is not about personality, as if women should be seen but not heard. No. A gentle and quiet spirit is about godliness. It's about bringing calm into the storms of life, about bringing peace into family situations by doing what is right and having an unshakable peace in God. Like holy, godly women in the past, she is to put her hope in God alone. She's a quiet, calm spirit because she doesn't forget God. Rather, she trusts him and puts him first. That's the sort of beauty she is encouraged to display in the family home and beyond as she chooses to follow her husband's loving leadership. Why? So that we show a watching world the love of Christ, the gospel on display. The husband, in his turn, is to be considerate and respectful. In other words, as it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What does that mean? It means husbands are charged by God to lay down their lives for the good of their wives. Jesus gave his all for his people, and so a husband is called to give his all for his wife, doing all he can to love and lead and serve and protect and provide for her while placing her comfort and her needs above his own. It means taking the time to listen to her, to know her concerns and dreams and desires. It means speaking tenderly and thoughtfully to her. It means he serves her and loves her. It means remaining faithful to her. He is accountable to God for how he leads his family, and his personal walk with Christ directly affects them. Christian husband needs to accept responsibility, work hard, and sacrifice himself for the good of his wife and his family. Again, why? To show a watching world the love of Christ. To show a watching world the gospel on display. Here's a quote from John Piper from his book, This Momentary Marriage. He says this, Marriage is patterned after Christ's covenant relationship to his redeemed people, the church. And therefore, the highest meaning and the most ultimate purpose of marriage 
is to put the covenantal relationship of Christ and his church on display. That's why marriage exists. If you're married, that is why you are married. If you hope to be, that should be your dream. End of quote. All of this is countercultural in a world that tells us that marriage is all about meeting my needs. But this is how God has created marriage to work. We can't do it in our own strength. Not only do we have the example of Christ, but we have his Holy Spirit at work in us. We will all mess up. But remember that Jesus carried our sin to the cross, so forgiveness and a fresh start is always available. But we also need to believe this, that marriage as God designed it is a beautiful thing. There are many examples of this. Look around our congregation. But here's just one example of what Christian marriage might look like and where years of working out these principles may lead. There's a guy called Robert McQuillan. He was the principal of a Bible college. His wife had advanced Alzheimer's disease. And these are the words he wrote when he resigned from his job to look after her. My dear wife, Muriel, has been in failing mental health for about eight years. So far, I've been able to carry both her ever-growing needs and my leadership responsibilities. But recently, it's become apparent that Muriel is content most of the time she is with me, and almost none of the time I'm away from her. It's not just discontentment. She's filled with fear, even terror, that she's lost me and always goes in search for me when I leave home. Then she may be full of anger when she can't get to me. So it is clear to me that she needs me now, full time. Perhaps it would help you to understand if I shared with you what I shared at the time of my announcement of my resignation in chapel. You see, the decision was made 42 years ago when I promised to care for Muriel in sickness and in health till death do us part. So as I told the students and faculty, as a man of my word, integrity has something to do with it. But so does fairness. She's cared for me fully and sacrificially all these years. If I cared for her the next 40 years, I would not be out of debt. Duty, however, can be grim and stoic, but there is more. I love Muriel. She's a delight to me. Her childlike dependence and confidence in me, her warm love, occasional flashes of wit I used to relish so, her happy spirit and tough resilience in the face of her continually distressing frustration. I don't have to care for her, I get to. It is a high honor to care for such a person. Well, we've seen this evening how we're to live as strangers. For those who are married, that means loving as Christ did, loving as equals, and loving as men and women with our different roles. But marriage, as God designed it, is a beautiful thing. Well, all of us are in different situations, so before we finish, let me give you now a few moments just to respond on your own to what we've seen in God's word this evening before we sing again. Let's pray.